The title of my message is Longing for Home. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your book this morning and share divine truths from your word, speak to our hearts, encourage our spirits. May we sense today that in the good times and the bad times, when we stand on the mountain peaks and sing, and we walk through the valleys, when the sun shines or the rain falls, when it's fair weather or stormy weather, may our hearts sing that God is good. Lead us to a deeper trust in you today and give us a longing for eternity. In Christ's name, amen. There's one thing that lifts the human spirit and keeps us going in spite of the challenges that we face. It's called hope. You see, hope is that intangible quality that looks beyond life's challenges for a better tomorrow. Hope leads us to live purposeful lives today because we know that a better day is coming. Hope anticipates the best in life, even when we're facing the worst in life. It looks beyond today to what will be tomorrow. You see, hope keeps believing, trusting, anticipating, and expecting that out of today's darkness, tomorrow's light's going to shine more beautifully. The Roman statesman Pliny once said this. He said, hope is the pillar that holds up the world. He was right. You see, without hope, society is on a collision course to disaster. Without hope, the foundations of our very lives collapse. Without hope, our lives are spent in silent despair. Now, someone defined Christian hope this way. They said, Christian hope is the expectation fueled by faith that somewhere beyond tomorrow, there's a brand new world. The Apostle Paul speaks of hope greatly throughout the book of Romans, throughout Corinthians, and in Titus, Paul talks about the blessed hope, the second coming of Christ that brings an end to the sickness and suffering and sorrow in our world. See, hope realizes that this world is not the end, that there's something better for us. Deep within our hearts, we know we were created for something better than sickness or suffering or heartache or death. See, deep within every heart, there's this longing for home, this longing for eternity, this longing for the better future. Now, this longing for home is revealed throughout Israel's journey in Babylonian captivity. If you look at the longing of Israel when they are in captive to Babylon, there's this longing for Jerusalem, this longing for home. The story of ancient Israel is not merely the story of a, the history of a people in captivity. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, we're told, and I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and particularly verse 11. So when we study the history of ancient Israel, and look at the Babylonian captivity, the history of Israel is not merely an ancient history. The history of Israel is rather an object lesson for what God's people will go through in the Babylonian captivity of this world just before the coming of Jesus. So the lessons of the past cast light on the present. these ancient lessons speak to us with meaning and purpose in our lives today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Can you read the text with me, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Reading either from your Bible or if you don't have the Bible from the screen. Now all these things happen to them as examples and they are written for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. What's admonition mean? What's another word for admonition? Our learning or our instruction. So everything that happened to ancient Israel in the Babylonian captivity happened as instruction for you, for me. Let's go back and reconsider this Babylonian captivity 
And this morning we're going to look at one psalm from that captivity and study every verse of that psalm and see its meaning and purpose to our lives today. So let's go back and get a little history of the Babylonian captivity. Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem three times. First time he attacked was in 605 BC. He brought Daniel and 15,000 other captives back to Babylon. Second time he attacked was in 597. He returned and attacked again. Now each attack became more fierce because the Jewish patriots resisted Nebuchadnezzar's attacks and did not yield to submission. Had they yielded, his attacks would not have been so furious. In 586, Nebuchadnezzar attacked again, but this time he ravaged Jerusalem. He destroys the city. Babylonian troops breach the walls. They loot they loot Jerusalem's treasures. They scorch Jerusalem's buildings. They slaughter young and old alike. Many are killed by the sword, spear, or arrow. But young children are taken and their heads are dashed against the rocks and they're totally destroyed. Now the reason enemy armies destroyed the children was this, for two reasons. One, to prevent these children from growing up so that uh, they would have revenge upon the attacking armies but second, to terrorize their families and bring absolute terror on these families when they saw their children's heads smashed against the rocks to bring terror to terrorize them into submission. Now the Babylonian soldiers shackled many of the teenagers. They looked for teenagers particularly that they could educate in the ways of Babylon and bring them back in captivity, and they looked for the intelligentsia they wanted to school the intelligent young Jews so they could be sent back as puppet rulers back to Jerusalem. Now, understanding this background, we turn to Psalm 137 that is the basis of our study this morning. The psalmist in, in Psalm 137 is in captivity. Now, most of the psalms are written by David about a thousand years before Christ, but some of the Psalms are not written by David. They are written by other Jews. This Psalm was written someplace between 597 BC and 570, someplace in that 20 year period. It is written by a Jew who has been taken into exile and is there in exile in Babylon. With that background, we turn to Psalm 137. The psalmist remembers the glory of Jerusalem. He is in captivity in Babylon. He remembers the destruction of the ancient city, the particular dominance of the enemy armies. He no longer belongs to a nation. He no longer has a capital city. He no longer has any center for Jewish life. Jerusalem, the kingdom is broken up. The city's desolated. The temple lay in ruins. The nation is scattered. The people are virtual slaves to their taskmasters. We can almost hear the weeping. We can almost hear the deep groans in Psalm 137. We can almost hear the heartfelt longing of this Jewish psalmist for whom we begin Psalm 137. We take this psalm in three or four verse segments, and we look at every section of the psalm as we study its nine verses. Now remember, the story of ancient Israel is your story, it's my story. Remember, the things that are written to ancient Israel are examples upon whom the ends of the world will come. Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon. Now you Remember, Babylon is a lush, plush city, has 13 temples to the pagan gods. The rivers of Babylon were the Euphrates and the Tigris. So here, out by himself, out by a natural spot, out there in nature, with the clear crystal rivers flowing by, listening to the bird songs, he's at a place of meditation. There are times in our lives when we go through deep sorrow, times in our lives we go through disappointment, times in our lives we go through challenges, we need to get away from it all. Out in some nature, natural scene to regroup, 
to bring our thoughts back together, to have that opportunity to meditate and pray. Verse 1, Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away at captive required of us a song. Those who plundered us required of us mirth, saying, sing one of the songs of Zion. Now, there are key words there that we need to look at and study. The first key word is Zion. In the Old Testament, Zion was used to denote Jerusalem. It was used to denote God's people. Zion was home. Zion represented Jewish culture, Jewish customs, Jewish faith. Zion represented family and friends and loved ones. Zion represented all the positive memories of their youth. But Zion was much more in the Jewish mind. Zion was the epicenter of Jerusalem. Zion was the dwelling place of God. Zion was the place of safety. Zion was the place of refuge. Zion was the place of security. And to these captive Jews, Zion represented the very presence of God. Now in the New Testament, Zion is sometimes used to represent the church. It's sometimes used to represent the heavenly city. Hebrew, keep, keep a marker in Psalm 37, 137, we're going back to it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. In the New Testament, we have the description of Zion. And notice what it says in Hebrews 12, verse 22. Once again, we're looking at that great chapter in Hebrews chapter 12. 12 that follows Hebrews chapter 11, the story of faith. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it says, But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Now notice the parallel. A captive Jew is filled with grief and sorrow. He goes out by himself by the rivers in Babylon. And he begins to think about Zion. He begins to think about home. He knows that Babylon is not his home. He knows that, that he is a pilgrim, a foreigner in another land. He sits there by the rivers of, Zion, of Babylon and he weeps for home. He weeps for that better day. He weeps for that day when captivity will be over. He weeps for that day when persecution will be no more. He weeps for that day that the oppressor's hand will be over. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that we too as Christians are pilgrims in a, father, in a foreign land. We too live in the Babylon of this world. We too long for a home and we recognize that this world is not our home. Back to Psalm 137. The psalmist groans are the groans of the human heart. They are the cries of all humanity. They reveal the longing of the human spirit for a home, for a better world. When calamity strikes unexpectedly, we cry out, Lord, this world is not my home. When chronic disease suddenly saps our energies, cripples our bodies, and reduces us to feebleness, we cry out, Lord, this world is not our home. When war, famine, natural disasters are plastered, across our TV screens and computer monitors, we cry out, Lord, this world is not my home. The cry of the psalmist in Psalm 137 is the cry of the human heart. It's the cry of the human spirit. It is the cry for home. It's the cry for suffering and sorrow and heartache to be gone forever. Back to Psalm 137. We look there at verse 2. Psalm 137. We look there at verse 2. Verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we remembered our homeland, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For those who carried us away, captive, notice the next word, required, they forced us to sing. And those who plundered us required, they forced us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. We would not sing. 
We placed our harps upon the willows with broken hearts filled with Greek longing for home. They could not play the songs of Zion or sing of their rich heritage in the enemy's land. You see, in Psalm 137, we hear Israel's weeping for their homeland. They wept in their captivity in a strange land. They wept over the destruction of their beloved city. They wept over the death of their loved ones. They wept in disbelief. Now look, we toured an enemy's land. Sorrow pierces our hearts like a sword. A loved one stricken with a dreaded disease with apparently no cure. The loss of a job creates final ad financial adversity and we never expected. Unjust criticism separates us from friends. Relationships are broken. A family member dies suddenly. Now, Psalm 137 provides for us three vital lessons for captives in a foreign land. Now, here's lesson number one. The Jews did not yield to the pressures of the culture around them. They believed despite of the circumstances. They would not give up. They faced the challenges. They did not sing when the Babylonians required them to sing. You see, their captives wanted to be amused. They wanted to make a mockery of these Jewish captives by forcing them to sing the songs of Jerusalem in the shadow of Belmarduk's temple. You see, Belmarduk was the, was the chief god. And so the songs of Zion were songs of triumph. The songs of Zion were songs of victory. The songs of Zion were songs of the prominence of the Jewish people. So you see what the Babylonians are doing. They're saying, in the shadow of Belmarduk's temple, in the midst of the splendor of this capital city, you're our captives, but sing the songs of Zion. Sing about the prominence of Israel. See, these Jews would not be squeezed into the culture of Babylon. The sorrow and shame of their exile had smitten their hearts too terribly to be stifled with the power of song. They didn't conform. They were not pressured into singing the songs of Zion for the entertainment of their captives. They hung their harps on the willow trees. They refused to sing to amuse their captives, captors. They stood firm. There are times that God calls us to stand firm in the midst of the world's temptations. There are times God calls us to stand firm and refuse the world's allurements. There are times that God calls us to unflinchingly stand for the right in the face of the intense pressure to conform. There are times God calls us to stand strong in the face of obstacles and difficulties and challenges and pressures. Echoing and re-echoing down the centuries comes the determination of the Jewish captives not to give up when the valley is deep and the night is dark and the mountain is high. The Psalm 137 calls us to courage it calls us to long for the homeland. This past week, I spoke at a pastor's convention in Chattanooga, Tennessee with about 200 pastors. And one of the pastors came to me the, after my first presentation. He said, Pastor Mark, I want to meet with you tomorrow because I have a book that I want to give you. And he said, it's an amazing book. You're going to want to get this book. Well, the next day when we met, he explained that he had been a missionary in Papua New Guinea and that he had worked far up in the jungles in Papua New Guinea. And he said one day he got word that five hours into the jungle by canoe, there was a village teacher that was teaching the word of God. And he was teaching from a little book and he had taught his entire village from that little book. And so this pastor friend said to me, he said, I was able to get a motorized canoe, so it only took me two days. And I went up through the treacherous jungle jungles and went up into this little village. And he said, when this man came to me, his name was Mala Kapala. And when Mala Kapala came to me, pastor, he came with this book. 
And his hands were trembling as he came with this book. Pastor, do you recognize this book? And I looked at the book, Studying Together, Mark Finley, a book with hundreds and hundreds of Bible texts. And I thought to myself, where did this primitive native way up in the jungles ever get a copy of this book? We don't know. But he came with this book. His hands were trembling. And he said, Pastor, I got a copy of this book. It is so precious to me with the hundreds of Bible texts that I copied it chapter by chapter, page by page, verse by verse, text by text. I copied it by hand. But I thought if I lose my hand copy, I better copy it again. And if I lose that one, I better copy it again. And if I lose that one, I better copy it again. Pastor, I copied this book four times. Four times. The book is so precious to me that I've never seen anything like it. Each day, I teach my people from this book. And although the opposition is fierce, I will never give up the truths I've discovered here. Our missionary said, look, I'm going to the United States. I may meet Pastor Finley. I have a brand new copy of that book in my library. If I come back in a month or two and bring you a brand new copy, will you trade me your old copy for that brand new copy? And the, 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 the Malaka Pala said, I will trade you. I'd love a new copy. So a few months later, the missionary goes back, trades out these copies. Mala has been mocked. Mala has been ridiculed. Malachi has been threatened, but he clings to his faith for one reason. He's longing for home. He's longing for home. He knows that the jungle life with its sickness and disease and poverty and tribal warfare and indiscriminate killing will not last forever. By faith, he looks beyond what is to what will be. Home beckons. Eternity calls Heaven appeals. He wouldn't allow the ancestor-worshipping, pig-eating, evil-dominated culture to quench his love for the word of God or keep him from standing firm for his beliefs. He had heard the call of Zion and he could not be moved. Eternity had beckoned and he could not be swayed. New Jerusalem was opened and its gates were opened wide and by faith, this primitive jungle native saw himself walking through the gates of heaven. He had heard the call of Zion and he could not be moved. He would not flinch. Lesson number one. The Israeli captives couldn't be pressured. They wouldn't give up their faith. They wouldn't yield in spite of obstacles. These captives knew that this world was not their home. Between here and eternity, between here and eternity, you and I are going to face obstacles. Between here and eternity, you and I are going to face difficulties. Between here and eternity, you and I are going to face challenges. But Zion calls. Zion calls. Home calls. This world is not our home. But there is a second vital lesson in Psalm 137. Take your Bible, please. Go back to Psalm 137. Three great lessons. Lesson number one. Israeli captives would not be pressured to yield to the customs of this world because they had seen another world. Psalm 137, verses 4 to 6. Psalm 137, verse 4 to 6. They're being pressured by the Babylonians to, a, to, to mock their homeland. Being pressured to sing the songs of Zion, not out of worship, but out, but out of ridicule that Babylon was stronger than Zion. Verse 4, Psalm 137. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem... Let my right hand forget her skill. This is an absolutely critical verse. In captivity, in bondage, they cry out, If I forget you, O Jerusalem. 
In other words, we're in bondage, we're in captivity. But keep my mind focused on Jerusalem, the very dwelling place of God in all our heartaches and difficulties. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, although they were captives in a hostile kingdom, they never lost sight of their identity. They recognized they were strangers in the land of Babylon and kept Jerusalem on their mind. Jerusalem was their chief joy. It dominated their thinking. It consumed their thoughts. It controlled their action. They were strangers in a foreign land. They were exiled in Babylon. They were captives to a hostile power, but their hearts and minds were far away. One of the greatest dangers for the 21st century church, one of the greatest dangers for people living on the knife edge of eternity, one of the greatest dangers facing Christianity today in general, and Adventists in particular, is that the culture squeezes us into its mold that we become identified with the culture, that our hearts and minds no longer long for eternity, that we're no longer shaped by what will be, but we're conditioned by what is. They're in captivity to Babylon. Their hearts and minds were focused upon heaven. They were focused on eternity. They sensed that they were pilgrims in the foreign land. We too are strangers in a foreign land. It's easy to be drawn into the culture around us, to lose sight of who we are. It's easy to lose our focus. It's easy to be shaped by our culture rather than shaping our culture. It's easy to become absorbed with worldly pleasures and consumed with earthly thoughts. It's easy to forget that this world is not our home. I love the words of the songwriter who wrote that wonderful song, This World is Not My Home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere. What? Beyond the blue. The angels beckon me. Do you hear the call of the angels from heaven's open door? And I can't feel at home in this old world. What is it called anymore? Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. The New Testament is filled with the teaching that you and I are walking through a pilgrim's land and this world is not our home. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 13th verse, speaking about the worthies of faith, speaking about those who have been faithful to God in this world. Those who've suffered the sword, suffered torture, ridicule, mockery, death. Those that died without ever seeing the promise of eternity. Hebrews 11, verse 13. What keeps you going? What fuels your faith? What puts a spring in your step? What puts a sparkle in your eye? What gives you new joy in the light of the world that we live in? Hebrews 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. These all died in faith, not seeing the promises. So the Old Testament worthies, the New Testament believers, did not see the realization of their hope, but they were assured of the fulfillment of God's promises. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. When sickness afflicts your body, when there are financial reverses that are beyond your control, when the devil attacks your marriages, when the family problems become greater, when discouragement sweeps over you like a shadow, grasp the reality that you are a pilgrim and you're a stranger. Grasp the reality 
that we are walking through this world for a short period of time, but eternity beckons. A now notice, what is a pilgrim? How do you define a pilgrim? I love what 1 Peter says. Look over here at 1 Peter chapter 2. You and I are pilgrims. This world is not our home. Babylon was not the home of those early Jewish captives. And what was written to them is written for us as examples. In this world of Babylon, with sin and wickedness all around us, with the Babylonian culture trying to squeeze us into its mold. For we are pilgrims and strangers. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. 1 Peter 2, verse 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you. Peter is, is urging them. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So Peter is saying here, don't allow the, the culture of this world to shape your thinking. Daily focus your mind on eternity. Daily focus your mind on the new Jerusalem. Daily have a vision of the gates of heaven that swing open. And Jesus there with arms wide open saying, welcome home, my child. Now notice both Hebrews and Peter use this expression that we're pilgrims, foreigners, and strangers. What's a pilgrim? A pilgrim is one who's on a journey of faith, believing there's something better on the horizon. I think about the pilgrims that left Europe. They left the old world. They, they sailed here to a new world. What, what reason did they do that? You know, 120 started out. As they started out in those rickety old ships, one of the ships was not certainly seaworthy, and about 18 of those pilgrims left and went back to Holland where they left from. 102 of those pilgrims continued. Why did they do that? Why did they experience starvation and sickness? In the first year here in America, of those 102 pilgrims, half of them died. Half died. There were 30 women. 18 of those women of childbearing age died. Why is it that these pilgrims who came to America would face privation, face starvation, face cold, suffering? Why did they do that? Because they wanted a new homeland. They wanted a new homeland. They wanted a homeland that was free from oppression. A homeland that was free from tyranny. A homeland that was free from the trials that they experienced in Europe. They longed for a new homeland where freedom reigned. They could worship God in the harmony with their own conscience. They longed to be free from the oppressors of the old world. They yearned for a homeland whereby they could be at peace, like these early pilgrims. And like pilgrims down through the century, those pilgrims in the Old Testament, like those Babylonian captives, like those pilgrims in the New Testament, like those early pilgrims that came to America, we walk through a world that's not our home. We walk through a land where we're foreigners, and we sense that we're strangers in this culture. But we know that we're homeward bound. There was a husband and wife living in the late 19th century that became extremely discouraged. The things of this world were strangling them. And a divinely enlightened writer in the 19th century wrote a letter to them that you can read that letter today. It's found in some books called The Testimonies to the Church, the ninth volume, pages 285 to 288. And I want to read you the divinely inspired words of encouragement to this couple 
going through a variety of challenges in their life. She, she writes, my brother, my sister, we are homeward bound. Can you say amen? We are homeward bound. He who, followed, uh, who loved us so much as to die for us has built us a city. And the new Jerusalem is our place of rest. There will be no sadness in the city of God. No wail of sorrow. No dirge of crushed hopes and buried affections will ever be heard. Soon the garments of heaviness will be changed for our wedding garment. Soon we shall witness the coronation of our king. Those whose lives have been hidden with Christ. Those who on earth have fought the good fight of faith will shine forth with the Redeemer's glory in the kingdom of God. Look up, look up and let your faith continually increase. Let this faith guide you along the narrow path that leads through the gates of the city of God into the great beyond the wide unbounded future of glory. It'll not be long till we shall see him in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. What if you were that couple going through discouragement? You receive this letter, you hold it in trembling hands, you look at your wife and you say, honey, look, look, we're homeward bound, last sentence. And in his presence, all the trials and sufferings of this life will be as nothingness. Whatever trial you're going through today, whatever difficulty you're going through today, whatever challenge you're going through today, let your faith grasp eternity because in his presence all the trials of this life will appear as what? Nothingness. In the face of the overwhelming challenges of our lives, like the Israelites of old, we remember Jerusalem. We remember our homeland. We long for eternity where problems of life will be over. We long for the day that we will meet Jesus face to face. Now here's the third vital lesson in the story. Third vital lesson in the story is this. They clung to the prophetic word. They believed a better day was coming. They carefully studied the Old Testament scrolls. And it was the prophetic word of the Old Testament that spoke of the destruction of Babylon, that spoke that their 70-year captivity would be over. They did not see evidence of that, but what they had was the word of God, and they clung to that word in spite of that evidence. Psalm 137, verse 7 to 9. Now, Psalm 137, verse 7 to 9, has one of the toughest verses in the entire Bible if you don't understand it. And we're going to take a look at that verse, but I need to get to it. So Psalm 137, verse 7 to 9. Verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom. When Babylon attacked Jerusalem, the Edomites also came in and took advantage of that attack and continued to destroy the city. Remember, O Lord, the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it. Now, that's not R-A-I-S-E, build it up. It is raise, R-A-Z-E, which means destroy it to its foundations. In other words, level the city. Level the city. So the Babylonians destroy it, and the Edomites are crying out, they're crying out, destroy it to its very foundation, verse 7. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. When the psalmist is captive in Babylon, and he sees the splendor and glory of Babylon all around him, how in the world could he say, Jerusalem's in ruins, how could he say, oh Babylon, you're going to be destroyed? It was faith, not in what he saw, but in the prophetic word of God. Now the next two verses are quite, quite difficult if you don't know the background. In these verses, one of them are used by atheists to try to disprove God's love, but I want to explain it to you. We're going to look at the last part of verse 8 and all of verse 9. I'll tackle verse 9, and then I will explain the rest of the, those three verses. Verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy shall be who repays you as you have served us. Happy shall he be who takes and dashes your little ones on the rocks. Now that's a tough text for many people. Happy will be the one who takes your little ones and crushes their head and makes them bloody upon the rocks. You see, first thing to notice is this. This is not God speaking. It's an Israeli Jew 
who has seen Jerusalem just devastated and, his, and the loved ones, including little children, destroyed. So that's number one. It's not God speaking. Number two, the books of Kings, Isaiah, and Hosea all speak about the murder of innocent children that was customary in ancient warfare and every single one of them say that it's one of the most cruelest, abhorrent practices and that God hates it. So you know already that this is not something endorsed by God. Now, secondly, what is this passage then talking about? The psalmist is simply saying this, in view of the fact that such horrible murders were conducted by the Babylonians against Israeli children. The psalmist is simply stating a law of life. As you have done, it shall be done to you. In other words, Babylon, you were happy when you came into Jerusalem and destroyed our children. But what you have to recognize is in the prophetic word, the enemies of righteousness, the enemies are going to come and they are going to destroy your city as well and you're going to experience exactly what we experienced. So what he is not saying that he is happy, he's not saying that God is happy, he's saying that the enemy will be happy when Babylon will be destroyed because of the fact that they are happy because that's the annihilation of their enemy. So this is not God speaking, this is not uh, the psalmist speaking, this is the psalmist recognizing that whatever we sow, we shall reap. That violence begets violence, kindness begets kindness. Now, the main point is this. The killing of children in the ancient world represented the entire complete destruction of the nation. And the psalmist is saying, Babylon, you were happy when you destroyed Israel, but your nation will be entirely destroyed. Now, let's though go to the main spiritual point of Psalm 137. What is the main spiritual point? The main spiritual point is found in verse 8. O daughter of Babylon who are to be destroyed. Again, I raise the question. There was no visible evidence of Babylon's destruction. Surrounded by Babylon's splendor, encircled by Babylon's might, military might. The psalmist by faith believes the prophecies of God's word. And he says, oh Babylon, you're going to be destroyed. Why does he? Because when the Jews were in Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah wrote them a letter. And the psalmist wrote, read the letter that Jeremiah wrote. He had no evidence of deliverance except the letter. And I want to read you. Would you like to read the letter that Jeremiah wrote? Would you like to read that letter that Jeremiah wrote? Here it is. It's in the Bible. We're going to go back to this letter. Uh, this Bible is an amazing book. This Bible is an amazing book. We can read a letter written by Jeremiah thousands of years ago to captives in Babylon that gave them courage. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Jeremiah. The 29th chapter. We're going to look there at verse 1 and 2. This is the letter. It's written about 595 BC, the same time that this psalm is written. So the, the psalmist reads the letter from Jeremiah. It embodies up his spirits. It encourages his hope. We're not going to be in Babylon's land forever. We're not going to be in captivity forever. We're not going to be in bondage forever. Sometimes you got to look beyond what your eyes see. Sometimes you got to look beyond what's around you. Sometimes, and before the coming of Jesus, every single one of us will have to cling by faith to the prophetic word and deny our senses, deny what we see, deny what we experience. But we will cling by faith. Here's Jeremiah's letter that the psalmist writes, Jeremiah 29. Now these are the words of the letter. They are the words of what, everybody? The letter. Who did he write it to? The prophet sent from Jerusalem. So where was Jeremiah? In Jerusalem. To the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive. To the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So Jeremiah 29 is the letter that was written 
to the captives in Babylon from the prophet Jeremiah. He wrote it to the elders who read it to the people. Now, what is the heart of that letter? Verse 10 and 11. You can read the whole letter this afternoon for Sabbath afternoon reading. It's an amazing letter. But here's the heart of it, verses 10 and 11. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon. I mean, if I'm reading that as a Jewish captive, what do I think? I think immediately, this captivity is not going to be forever. That This captivity, we're, we're going to go back to our homeland. We, we've been going year after year, decade after decade, but home is on its way. The prophet said so. To pilgrims walking through this world, we still read the prophetic word. We still believe that home is on its way. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word to you and cause you to return to this place. Verse 11, God speaks to the captives in Babylon. And God says to the captives in Babylon, For I know that the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, when you are going through difficulty, when you're going through bondage, it's not going to last forever. Homeland is beckoning. Jerusalem is calling. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and give you a hope. I am a Jew supposedly there by the rivers of Babylon and I look at the splendor of Belmarduk's temple and there while I am there I, re I take the letter of Jeremiah on that old scroll. I begin reading it in my hand and as I read it I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future. And that's what God says to you this morning. Captives in a foreign land. Pilgrims on a journey to eternity, and God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of good, not evil. The prophetic word buoyed their spirits. The prophetic word fueled their hopes. The prophetic word encouraged their hearts. The prophetic word assured them of a better future. The prophetic word was the guarantee that one day their suffering would be over. Just as the prophetic word spoke to those Israelites of Babylon, so God speaks to us in the prophetic word. God speaks to us in the prophetic word. He speaks to us that one day the longing of our hearts for eternity will be realized. One day there'll be a land without sickness, suffering, heartache, or death. He speaks to us in the prophetic word. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Revelation chapter 21. Beyond what our eyes see, beyond what our ears hear, beyond what our hearts even experience at time, when the sword pierces our hearts, we read the prophetic word, and just like those Jewish captives, the prophetic word gives us hope. The prophetic word gives us courage. The prophetic word buoys up our spirit. John says, look with me. John says, vision with me. John says, see with me. Now I saw, Revelation 21, 1 to 4, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. The ancient Jewish captives in Babylon were looking to old Jerusalem. They wanted to see that city rebuilt. But we are looking for a new city, a new Jerusalem. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down as a bride out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He shall dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Echoing and re-echoing down the centuries, there is a message of hope that speaks to this generation. This world is not your home. Never become enthralled with its fleeting pleasures. We are pilgrims and we're strangers here. There's a better land coming, hallelujah. The dwelling of our hearts for something better is the God-implanted desire for eternity. Nurture that desire. Feed that desire. Fan the flames of that desire. And by faith, cling to the divine reality. A better world is coming, and Jesus Christ soon will return. We are pilgrims. We're strangers. He was only... 27 years old and died of tuberculosis. 
his dreams were crushed when James was in his teens his dad wanted him to be a printer so he learned the printing profession did so well at it that he then tried his hand at sales never could really figure out what he wanted but when he was in his mid-twenties and fairly successful in business James felt the call to go into ministry that call is a deep convicting call that does not shake you felt that call to go into ministry he left the printing business could no longer go back to printing secular employment could no longer go back to his merchants way of life and selling there was a deeper call a larger call 25 years old went back to the seminary studied theology had his first pastorate when he was 27 years old his pastorate lasted six months because he got tuberculosis and when he had tuberculosis he sensed that the end was near he wrote the song that's in our hymnals hymn number 445 and I want to read the verses of that song with you Joe would you hand me a hymnal please I just want to read the verses 445 this song was written by a young man in his late twenties who knew that his life was soon to be over a young man who had been called to ministry verse one I'm but a stranger here now imagine he's lying on his bed coughing his fever is high his strength is ebbing away his life is almost gone I'm but a stranger here heaven is my home the earth is a desert drear heaven is my home danger and sorrow stand round me on every hand heaven is my father's land heaven is my home what through the tempest rages heaven is my home short 28 years old short is my pilgrimage heaven is my home times cold and wintry blast soon will be overpassed I shall reach home at last heaven is my home there at my Savior's side heaven is my home I shall be glorified heaven is my home they'll be the good and the blessed those I've loved most and best there too I shall rest heaven is my home whatever you are going through this morning whatever temptations you face this week however your friends as a young person try to allure you in the temptations of this world however sickness grips your body however your body shakes with fever or is seized by pain however the sword of sorrow pierces your heart however financial reverses cause you to to be poverty stricken however critical tongues wag and destroy your reputation however weary you feel let your heart rejoice because heaven is our home and may the joy of heaven and the glory of heaven fill your heart put a new spring in your step and a smile on your face and a sparkle in your eyes because you and I are strangers here